three of the seven seats on the North Carolina Supreme Court are up for grabs this election cycle. Now, the result of North Carolina's vote will either cement the Democrats' hold on the state's highest court or add a bit of Republican balance. But many North Carolinians really aren't even sure why these seats are so important and how they impact our lives. Well, to get some answers to that very important question, we turn to John Guzay. He is the John Locke Foundation's Director of Legal Studies. He's been writing about the importance of the court at johnlocke.org. John, welcome back to the program. Glad to see you. Thanks, Anna. What is at stake this election cycle with these three seats on the North Carolina Supreme Court? Well, what's at stake really are the laws that are going to govern us for at least the next four years. People don't often realize it when it comes to the state Supreme Court, but in fact, the justices on the state Supreme Court have more power over our, the laws to govern us in many ways than the members of the legislature, than the governor, or even the citizens as a whole. That would be shocking to a lot of folks, John. First of all, many people don't realize that we even elect justices to the Supreme Court here in our state, which of course we do. They may not realize also that these are partisan races, so the ballot will actually tell you who the candidates are and which candidate is a Democrat, which candidate is a Republican. What types of things will come before the court, John, that will have such direct impact on each and every one of us? Well, let me, before I, I answer that question, let me just um, talk about something you brought up, which is the fact that our justices are elected. That's actually a very good thing. Given that Supreme Courts at every level of government have become, in effect, super legislators, super legislatures, it's very good that we get to elect ours. At the US Supreme Court, they're appointed for life. So uh, as citizens of the United States, we are stuck with decisions that affect our laws made by members of a super legislature, and we don't even have the opportunity to vote them out of office. In North Carolina, we do. And here's what I mean when I say that the Supreme Court is a mini, is a super legislature. The North Carolina General Assembly can vote in a law. The governor can approve it, but it's still up to the Supreme Court because of certain doctrinal changes that took place in the second half of the 20th century. It's now up to the Supreme Court to decide whether the law is enforceable, it's also up to the Supreme Court to decide what the law means. They can change the meaning in ways that the legislators would never have wanted or recognized or intended, but nevertheless, that becomes the law. So that's why I say they're the super legislator, super legislature, and that's why it's so important that we pay attention to who's running, find out what their uh, judicial philosophy is, and vote. John, it's very interesting, I think, the issue of um, philosophy and also political party affiliation. As I mentioned, these are partisan races. There is a Democrat Party nominee. There is a Republican Party nominee for each of these three seats. But people might be listening to us and saying, well, hey, wait a second. This is a court. This is supposed to be uh, justice is blind. Uh, we, we learned that in school. So why does it matter that we know all sorts of information, such as party affiliation and philosophy. Well, unfortunately, the idea of justice being blind went out the window in, in North Carolina in the 40s and 50s. And uh, all across the country, the same thing happened. The intention was to actually weaken the power of the Supreme Court at the US level. But the effect was actually to make it more powerful. Two, two, two pieces of judicial philosophy came in. One was this idea of living documents. Constitutions and laws were regarded as living documents, the meaning of which could change depending on changing the uh, situations, changing the ideas of what's needed. And the other one um, was this idea of, of judicial deference, which means that the court should simply defer to the legislature when it's a kind of regulation that the courts approve of. Between them, Justices who adopt those kinds of philosophies can make the law anything they want to be. Now, not all justices have done this. There's a, a, there's a growing movement in this country started with, at the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court with Anthony and Scalia, that's called originalism. The idea is that a judge's job isn't to decide what the law ought to be. He simply needs to apply the law as it's written. And if there's any doubt about what the meaning of the written law is, well, it means whatever people understood it to mean at the time it was um, written or ratified. 
that keeps the courts where they belong, uh, not as legislatures, but as, as courts adjudicating disputes. And we should be looking for judges and justices who adopt that philosophy. To some extent, you can get a feel for it by political party in general. In general, Republicans are more likely to be originalists than Democrats, but it's not a sh sure and fast thing. What you really, if you're taking your responsibility as a voter seriously, you should try to find out what a judge or justice, what a candidate for justice has said about their philosophy, and even better if they've got a record on the bench, find out how they ruled in cases. Did they decide based on maybe what they thought their policy preference was or what they thought their party wanted them to do? Or did they decide the case on the basis of the law as it was written? That's such an important point. And that is the reason why here on Carolina Journal Radio, we're talking about these races and different decisions. John, you've been writing about this at johnlock.org. My Carolina Journal Radio co-host Mitch Kokai has been writing about different rulings from the North Carolina Supreme Court. He writes at carolinajournal.com. The point is, of course, to be an informed voter and to take in all this information and then make your choice when it comes to election time. John, as you know, one of the three seats that is on the ballot in November is the seat for the Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. The Democrat is Sherry Beasley. She is the incumbent, the current Chief Justice. Her challenger is Republican uh, Justice Paul Newby, who currently sits on the, the court. Tell us about the role of the Chief Justice and why it's such a critical seat and that it matters who is elected. Well, uh I got to contradict you a little bit. I don't think it matters all that much in North Carolina. It's not like the U.S. Supreme Court, where the chief justice has a lot of both moral and practical influence on how the, the cases um, develop. In North Carolina, he can't, the, the chief justice doesn't get to decide, <laughs> he doesn't get to proceed, preside over the, um, the hearings on the case. He doesn't get to assign which justice writes the opinion. So I actually don't think it, um, if, if, just, if Paul Newby gets elected as chief justice, he might have a little bit of moral authority over the others simply because he's a chief, but he'll be new. I don't think it, I think it's, it's an important just because it's a member of the court, but I don't think it's important very much beyond that. Right now, the makeup is uh, six Democrats, one Republican on the North Carolina Supreme Court. So let's just say for the sake of discussion, John, that the Republicans do well in the election and that North Carolinians elect one Republican, two Republican, even as many as three Republicans. What about this question of, quote, balance on the court? What is that? And is it something for people to consider? Well, it is. I mean, uh, sadly, we do see that very often and ju justices on the Supreme Court vote along party lines. Partly that's because of what I said before, Democrats are more likely to take a flexible living, living document approach to the law. Republicans are more apt to be strict constructionists and originalists. But um, I would hope that everybody on the court, regardless of their political party, would recognize they have a duty to apply the law without fear, and without favor, equally to everyone. I think we should appeal to their best instincts and to their integrity as judges and just remind them of their duty.